Hello, my name is Edward Dunn from the American Mathematical Society. Uh, I'm the editor of Ruben Hirsch's brand new book, uh, Experiencing Mathematics. It's about the philosophy of mathematics. Uh, what do we do when we do mathematics? Ruben Hirsch is well known uh, for his writing as well as his teaching. Um, and we're happy to have Ruben as uh, an author for the American Mathematical Society publishing program. Right now, Ruben and I will be discussing some of the topics that occur in his book. Ruben, it's nice to have you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to tell the world what we do when we do mathematics. So with the book, you know, you, 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 you've thought now for 40 years about what it is we do when we do mathematics. Um, and you, you've spoken about the reality of our thoughts, uh, the reality of our shared thoughts. And, uh, um, and perhaps distinct from the reality or non-reality of private thoughts. Um, how does this explain what it is we're doing when we do mathematics? Well, the, the thing that I feel proudest of, if I dare to say pride, it's is, is, the, is the most recent article in here, the one that I wrote most recently. Because I really think I've given a clear and convincing answer to an important question. And I want to explain about it, if you'll allow me to go into it. It's about the nature of mathematical proof, which is a very central question about when you want to know what is mathematics, what is proving. And I, uh, for quite a while, have written about what it's not. You see, one of the things that I found so confusing was the claim, the argument that's commonly made by people who are not mathematicians, that mathematicians' proof is either is simply logic or is essentially logic or is essentially can be reduced to logic or if you really explain it, it'll all come down to logic. That, that really can't be maintained if you just look at the evidence. Mathematicians who are not logicians rarely know much about logic and never refer to it in their writing. It's just, you can't find it. And then the logical idea of a proof, which we've all learned, maybe in high school or elsewhere, you have some axioms which you have to assume because you have to start somewhere. So you just assume them postulate them if you wish. And then you have rules of logic that take these statements, and if you're a little bit advanced, you write them down according to rigid rules using admitted symbols. That's called formalization. And then the rules tell you what you can do with these stacks in, and you finally stop somewhere, and that's the conclusion. And if you know where you're trying to go, the conclusion would be what you're trying to prove. And that's supposed to be mathematical proof. Well, that's interesting, and it's close enough to machine logic, so it's even useful and important, and has led to some amazing things in modern logic, like Gödel and mm -hmm. Turing and, and mm -hmm. so on. I've written about the subjects. So right. I don't downplay them at all. Mm -hmm. Modern logic is an extremely important, successful subject, but the logical proof is just not what mathematicians do. That's a scandal, perhaps, <laughs> but it's staring you in the face. So then, if you admit that radical, subversive fact, how do we get away with it? <laughs> what do I mean, get away with it? Well, I or any other mathematician claims to have a proof and if we succeed, if it's accepted and published, that means any other mathematician who is capable of reading it and understanding it has to accept it. That's what really happens. And that's what makes mathematics different from everything else. You can't do that in any other subject. Prove something and force everybody else to admit you were right. If you could, then what you were doing would be said, oh, that's not linguistics, that's mathematical mm -hmm. linguistics. Mm -hmm. If it reached that stage of absolute 
undeniability of an argument. Mm -hmm. It would be called mathematical. That's the characteristic right. thing of mathematical reasoning, that we can come to some claim and everyone else who knows what we're talking about, who's qualified, sees it and says, yes, that's right. And the question is, which I didn't even recognize until I read it in somebody else, I want to give credit to Professor Brendan Larvoy of Hertfordshire, mm -hmm. England. And I realized as soon as I read this question in his paper, yes, that's important. He said, what qualifies mathematical proof as proof? And I'm not even sure how to interpret the word qualify, but to me, the question is, what makes it work? That is to say, why is it compelling? So that's the question. If you have a logical proof where you're following the rules of logic, then everyone says that is compelling. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of logic, that it preserves truth. But we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. And yet, we get away with it. That's what mathematics is all about. Proving stuff that everybody else accepts and it becomes established. Why does everybody accept it if it isn't really complete logical proof? I think that's really a question once it's formulated clearly uh, demands consideration, serious question. But yet, you can answer it by just paying attention to what we do. That's mm -hmm. all I claim. Mm -hmm. That I didn't discover anything, I just paid attention to what we do, and not only to what I see that I do and others do, but to see what other mathematicians have said. And in this paper, I quote G.H. Hardy, uh, Alan Kohn, uh, uh, Wiles, Al Alexander. Andrew Wiles. Andrew Wiles, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, David Ruel, mm -hmm. uh, and others top-notch mathematicians have actually written about their own work. Mm -hmm. The thing is that when they try to explain what they do, including proving, they are forced to speak metaphorically, using figures of speech, mm -hmm. which are not hard to understand if you just grasp that they are using metaphors for their mental activity. Mm -hmm. But and here I please don't want people to get mad at me. I'm just forced to say it. Practically no philosophers pay the slightest attention. Mm. Because it doesn't look like philosophy mm -hmm. what these mathematicians write. Even though it's about this most basic question. How does mathematical reasoning including truth work? So all that I'm doing is describing it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to do now. I feel somewhat apologetic because it's a huge claim. But I'm just saying what anybody will say, will say yes, that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. so, so there are, are two... You see, when people talk about it, they, they, they use terms like you can see it or even you bang into it. The <laughs> final experience of recognizing a proof is experienced as directly seeing something. And yet, what is there to see? It's all in your mind. That's just the point. There is something there in your mind, and you cannot see it, but access it because it's in your mind. So, what's in your mind? Some mathematical thing, which I call a mathematical model, Whatever is there when you're doing math. When you're doing math, you're working with something. You're turning it over in your head, as we say. You're taking it apart, upside mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. connecting with other things. All these words are meaningful. You are really doing something. Mm -hmm. And you're not doing it to nothing. You're doing it to something. The thing you're working on is the mathematical model, whether it be the model as I use in my paper, of a cube, or of a differentiable function, or of uh, an integral operator, mm -hmm. 
or a homotopy group, if you want, mm -hmm. whatever the mathematical entity is, people may think of it formally in terms of the formula on a page. So we have the mathematical the, model. The, there is some, when you do mathematical work, whether on a differentiable function, a homotopy group, or whatever else you like, you're working on an entity, an object, a thing. Where is it? It's in your mind. You're aware of it. You're conscious of it. And it's an actual object. I call it a mathematical model. And the difficulty is that people have a reluctance, a hesitation to admit, yes, this is a real something, even though it's a thought. And it's not just a fiction or a fantasy because your thoughts are in your brain and your brain is in your body and it's all something that really has some kind of representation or consequence or image or whatever you like in terms of your nerves and your brain fluid. Mm -hmm. We know that we are actually made of flesh and blood and our mental activity is an activity of our flesh and blood, including our mathematical work and our mathematical thoughts. And because the flesh and blood is real and its activity is real, so are our thoughts are real things, including mathematical thoughts. So that's the story. We are, when we do mathematics, we are working with these mental models we have of mathematical entities. And we can be convinced that such and such is so because this thing is there in our minds, accessible to us to see mentally. Mm -hmm. So. In the end, a mathematician is convinced that something is so about a cube because he can see it just the way a chemist is convinced that something is true about a compound or a, uh, an element because he sees the experiment before him. It's just an internal seeing instead of an external seeing. That's my answer. Proofs are convincing because the mathematicians can show each other how to see it in their own minds. That's what a mental, that's what a mathematical proof is. Right. The instructions, how a mathematician can get to see that something is so. Mm -hmm. And it may be a very complicated instruction and very hard to discover and explain. But that's why it's convincing because the mathematician who's convinced has acquired the ability to see it in his own brain. So, sorry for running on and on, but that's, I think, really the right answer. I'm sorry. It is. And Take I, it or leave it. I find it very pleasing the way you phrase the answer in that um, the existence of the mathematical model relies on the existence of the mathemat mathematician's brain as a physical object. When you think back to the beginning, we were speaking of Descartes and the mind-body problem. You resolve the mind-body problem by connecting them, as opposed to separating them. Thank you. That's wonderful to hear you say that. <laughs> and, and, if, and, you know, Descartes had the tools in front of him to see this, but something about his own thought kept them separate. No, it wasn't about his own thoughts. It was about his position. Descartes okay. was terrified by what had happened in Italy to Bruno ah, and Galileo. Okay. Okay. Descartes fled from France to Holland for safety sure. and stayed there. Descartes consciously, this is irrelevant, really, <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating fact. Descartes consciously, in science, took the position that experiment, observation, is our teacher, not the books. Mm -hmm. And he consciously said and followed faithfully the rule that this does not apply to religion. He was smart. He didn't want to have his head chopped off. <laughs> but you see the, the bond he gets put in is philosophy. Indeed. His whole meditation that everybody knows, I think therefore I am, not everybody realizes that's the beginning of a sequence of meditations which has the goal and purpose of refuting atheism and establishing religion. So he was trapped. He was a scientist who was forced to bow down and kiss the robes of the priest. 
you know how he died? Well, he knew that he had to do that without being asked to do that, which was the Do you know how this poor man died? Nope, I do not. Everyone should know this. He was not only a Catholic, but a royalist, a true believer in the divine right of kings. Not uncommon in those days. He was invited by a queen, Christina of Sweden, to come and teach her. What an honor. He arose from Constable Holland, where he stayed, to Stockholm, I guess. This queen was a real intellectual queen. She wanted philosophy lessons early, five o'clock in the morning. He caught pneumonia and died. <laughs> That's tragic, isn't it? It is. He should indeed. have stood in bed. <laughs>